Well, let's take a little time here and talk about some of the basic principles of energized fencing. I think the biggest thing most people don't recognize is that energized fence is a psychological barrier. If you've been around fencing years before, we're probably used to fences being physical barriers. Board fences, corral fences, woven wire fences, even barb fences are types of physical barriers. But an energized fence is a psychological or mental barrier. It's the shocking power of the fence that deters the animal. Typically for wire, we're looking at 14 gauge or 12 and a half gauge triple galvanized high tensile wire. 12 and a half gauge is the most common uh, for most situations, although in, in some semi-permanent situations or in pasture subdivision situations, the 14 gauge may be applicable. We get a lot of questions on how many wires do I need on my fence for whatever type of animal. Um, the general rule of thumb is that the harder the animal to control, the more wires you need. However, there's a lot of debate on this out there right now. I uh, just wanted to illustrate here, here's a very simple fence. This is a single strand of high tensile wire, about 32 inches off the ground, posts about every 50 feet, and it's got about 4,000 volts of uh, juice on it. And this is a perimeter fence. This is not an interior fence, and it's holding back uh, about 40 head that are grazing this site and we just wanted to illustrate this to show or ask the question how much fence do you need and once your animals are trained to high tensile energized fence um, if you do a good job of maintaining voltage on that fence it really doesn't take a lot as we've seen in other videos we can get by with animals that are well trained well fed well watered uh, especially cattle behind a single hot wire or even two hot wires can work extremely well you may see uh, for example, specifications from the NRCS that say it has to be four wires. Um, that works for some people, that works in a lot of situations, and others that may be overkill for you. You're going to have to make those decisions and determinations. I would talk to a few people who are grazers, who are using energized fence with the types and classes of animals that you're looking at grazing. Find out what works for them and why it works for them. I think that's probably one of the best things. There are some general specifications out there. Usually those specifications lean on the very conservative side. They're going to have more wires instead of less um, because they're trying to protect themselves from liability, even whether it's a government agency or a fencing manufacturer. But I would talk to some grazers, go to some, to some pasture walks, to some field days, see what they're doing, see what's working for them, ask them about their success rate on keeping animals in and why it's working for them them and that's a good place to start. Your end and corner bracing assemblies are extremely critical. On a high tensile energized fence they're just like the foundation of your house. They're what's supporting everything else. So it's very important that we do a good job on here on these. Uh, usually for if we're only running one or two wires on an interior situation we can get by with a single post. It's set at least the depth of the height of that top wire of that post and leaning slightly away from the pull of that wire. Um, that can be very adequate for up to two wires. On three or more wires, we're gonna need something more substantial. The most common is an H brace situation. There's also a New Zealand diagonal brace that's out there. And then there's also uh, a fiberglass system. Uh, the trade name is the Mule system and we'll be showing and demonstrating all of these for you. As far as line post materials, uh, some of the most common are going to be wood posts with nail-on insulators, such as this pinlock insulator here. It could be plastic or it could be fiberglass. Uh, looking at an application of a fiberglass line post here with one of the no numerous clip applications here, this is just a set screw on a plastic clip. Uh, these can also be drilled in a cotter key, stainless steel cotter key type clip can be applied and there's also a spring uh, type clip that can go on here. One option for line posts on a perimeter uh, high tensile energized fence is using wood posts uh, every 90 feet as we see here. And then there are spacer battens that are just pieces of PVC pipe. They were custom made. They just sit on the ground uh, to maintain our wire spacing. One of the ways of ensuring adequate voltage on the fence is to avoid using steel T-posts for line posts. Some of the reasons for that are fairly obvious. If the wire comes off the insulator, 
contacts that steel T-post, we have a dead short of the fence, we can lose most or all of our voltage at that time. can be a real problem. Now most energized manufacturers do not recommend using steel T-posts, yet all of them offer steel T-post insulators because they know and understand the American farmer. You've got steel T-posts available to you for whatever reason, you're probably going to want to use them. If that's your situation, what I'd strongly encourage you to do is use those steel T-posts only in places that you frequent and can keep an eye on and observe on a regular basis. Don't put them on the back 40, don't put them back in the bush where, where the deer can run into them, an elk can knock them off, whatever, a tree branch can fall off and short that fence out. Keep them out in the open where you can uh, keep a close eye on them on a regular basis here and you're going to be a lot better off. But in general, we, we tend to want to avoid those for all the problems they can create. Here's kind of another problem that can happen. Um, we haven't had a lot of rain this summer and the birds like to perch up here. And so this is bird dropping accumulation on this insulator here and you can hear it ticking. You can hear the short uh, there and that's taking voltage out of the fence. That's not something we want. And if we have hundreds of these out there and, and that accumulates uh, over time, um, we can really pull a lot of voltage out of the fence. Your line posts in an energized fence are basically your spacer battens. They're maintaining your wire spacing for you. The distance between your line post on most energized fence applications can run anywhere from 20 feet to 100 feet. 100 feet is getting to be a little bit of a stretch. The most common is 30 to 50 feet. And it may be closer than that on uneven terrain. If we have uneven terrain, we need to deal with that and you'll have to just put a post where it makes the most sense. As far as line post insulators are concerned, most of those are some sort of high density plastic. There's many different types on the market. Um, these claw type are real common. And then the pin locks are also very common. Both of them work. Make sure they're a high density plastic. These can be, some of these can be attached with fence staples, some with screws, some with galvanized nails. Um, it's just whatever you want to use on those. Get a quality insulator, uh, pay the extra money. Um, they tend to last a very long time. I've seen these go out 20, 20 plus years. Talk about insulators uh, a little bit here. There's a number of types on the market here. Um, we have high density reinforced plastic. Um, make sure that you do get that. There are cheaper versions of this out there. Uh, those cheaper versions are not going to handle up to the strain of high tensile wire nor take the impact of something hitting, hitting it. So make sure you get high density plastic. Porcelain, there's several different types. There's the porcelain bullnose as well as the porcelain donut. And we want to be very specific about the porcelain. There's also ceramic material. The difference is ceramic material is a glazed coating over a porous material. And when that glaze coating on a ceramic insulator gets cracked, that porous material inside can absorb moisture and you can have a short on that fence. Porcelain's a high density material, it's not as porous. Even if this cracks, it's not going to absorb moisture and it's still going to work as an insulator and not be a short on that fence. Um, really watch uh, when you pick up a product, uh, wherever you're getting your products at, you know, a lot of times the advertising on the front of the box will say porcelain insulator. You read the fine print on the back and it says made with ceramic materials. Really watch that and make sure it's true porcelain materials when you use that. There's another type of insulator out there we use for end and for terminal and that's these wraparound uh, tube type insulators. The wire goes through here. They're reinforced with a metal strip in here. Um, contractors like to use them because they're fast, they're easy, and they're cheap. And it gets them the low bid and they get the job. Okay. Um, some of the disadvantages to these are is they tend not to last as long as some of the other high quality insulators. Um, through vibration, friction, rubbing, things like that, they just tend to wear a little quicker so the life expectancy isn't as high. After five to seven, maybe out to ten years if you're fortunate, these pretty much need to be replaced. I've seen a lot of these go out 15 out to 20 years before they need to be replaced. You don't get the life out of them. They're very common. You'll see a lot of them around. Just because they're common doesn't mean they're the best. Usually it means because they're the cheapest 
uh, when we're dealing with a lot of this stuff. But just be aware, if it's a semi-permanent fence situation where it's only gonna be up for a few months, great option, it's cheap, you're gonna take it up, put it down, not a big deal, but in a permanent or perimeter type fence application, I guess I'd urge some, urge some caution there. I also wanna stop and look at a spring and strainer assembly. Uh, that's mounted here and what it looks like. Uh, this is an inline ratcheting type strainer. This is a tension spring. Um, we're gonna put these together so they function as one unit. To do that, we grab two of the dogs of the spring and pull this apart. Uh, you'll see there's notches on here. And these notches are something we're gonna pay attention to as we tension the spring down. We're gonna use that as a gauge to indicate how much tension we have on the fence. So just take a moment to note that. Tuck that here. So we slide our strainer on like this. And notice that these two hooks here, so we want the two on the other side that we have out. Pinch them together like that. Slide them through and hook it just like that. 